Walking through the valley of the shadow of death, as described in the 23rd Psalm, is a journey that we will all take at some point. For at some point, all of us will lose someone that we love dearly. And so this month, we're looking at this question, how do we walk through the valley of the shadow? Last week, we began preparing for this. We began looking at uh, what what does it mean to prepare for the valley? Live a life following Jesus, learning to pray and to study scripture, to serve. That that these are the ways we prepare. But then, then comes a moment when we walk into the valley itself. And it's no longer abstract. It's something that we're actually doing. Uh, as, as last week, there's a painting to go along with this week, if you'll put that up. This uh, shows this idea that we, you're walking through this valley and the valley is dark. You walk with, I will fear no evil for thou art with me. When you walk through the valley, you face grief. That, that's sort of what happens. When you're walking through the valley of the shadow caused by death, that shadow is grief. And as a culture, we really don't like grief. If you listen to how culture would form us to handle grief, grief is something that is private, not to be spoken of. It should only last a certain amount of time. Weeks, maybe months, but no more. It is a short period of time and everyone's grief goes through a cert- the same thing, that we all, you get angry and then you bargain, deny, accept, you move on, you're done with your grieving. And we have this sense that grief can be compared, that losing a child is worse than losing a spouse, is worse than losing a parent, is worse than losing an aunt, and there's a sort of a hierarchy of grief. And really the worst thing about what our culture says about grief is that grief is a problem to be fixed. It's something you just got, got to handle, you got to get a handle on and fix that problem. And to all of these things about grief, I, I say fooey. None of them actually are true. None of them are what actually happens when you are walking through the valley of the shadow. Grief is something to be spoken of. It takes as long as it takes. There is no set pattern to grief. And you cannot compare grieves. You can't say that because you lost someone more important or less important, you should grieve more or less. It it, doesn't work like that. And most of all, grief is not a problem to fix. It's a journey to take. Grief is not a problem to fix. It's a journey to take. We don't cure grief. We don't fix it. We don't avoid it. It's a journey we're going to take. And we're looking at that journey today. Now as we look at this journey of grief, this journey through the the valley of the shadow of death, there are a couple tasks and a couple questions that have to be handled as as we take this walk, whenever we take it. There are a couple tasks and a couple questions. We're going to look at those today. First, we're going to look at the tasks that have to be done. I'm going to tell these tasks to you in an order because I can't tell them to you not in an order. But I don't want you to hear these tasks and think that they're sort of linear. You, linear. you do this, and then this, and then this, and then this, and then you're done. That, that's not the case. I'm going to tell you about these tasks, and, and you do them, when you do them, how you do them, however. There's no right way to do it. When, you find, when a loved one dies and you find yourself grieving, one of, the, one of the tasks is experiencing the pain of that loss. You might, when someone you love dies, if, if you don't feel pain, if you are not weeping for that loss, don't think you've dodged the bullet, you're going to experience the pain at some point. It's just a matter of when. I was talking to a pastor on Friday in Kirksville, and we were talking about what was up, and I mentioned this sermon series, and he said, you know, that's funny, because... When my grandma died, I couldn't go home for the funeral, and I never wept for it. It never really was something real to me. She was just kind of gone. And then, then years later, three years later, he told me he was writing a paper, and the book struck. The book he was writing on struck him just the right way, hit a nerve that had not been hit in a long time, and he found himself weeping for his grandmother that had died three years ago. I mean, we are going to weep for the people that we have lost. And that is part of, of this, this journey. We are going to, to suffer, and, and that is, that's okay. And, and it's going to happen at unexpected and weird times. Something will strike you, a piece of music, an anniversary, so, something will strike you, and, and we will all suffer that, that, in that moment that we're reminded of, and that, that's part of grieving. So we, we experience the, 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 the pain, and then we also have to accept that the person is gone, accept the loss. Go to the funeral. See the person and say that they are, they're gone, they're dead. They're not just gone. That, no, they have gone to be with God and, and they are not coming back this side of the kingdom of God. 
there's this unfortunate tendency that I'm seeing more of to say, you know, we don't want to have a funeral because it's such a buzzkill, or we don't want to have a funeral because it's just so depressing, and, you know, we need those moments. We need to gather and, and accept as a community, this person is gone, and that's, that's where we're at. So experience the pain, accept the loss, and adjust to the life that's going to be without the person. And this varies by, by the situation. If you're going to adjust to, to life, whatever was normal no longer can be. It's going to be a new normal. And that new normal is going to look different for different people. When one person loses a spouse, that spouse keeps every single pair of shoes in the exact same place, puts the wedding ring on a chain, keeps the house, lives on the family farm till the day they die, and that's, that's what they need to do. Another spouse sells everything, sells the farm, moves to town, gets remarried, and that's what they need to do. How you adjust to whatever your new life is going to be is okay. You just have to adjust to it. And that's, then there's this, this last thing of reinvesting yourself. Whatever this new normal is going to be, you got to do her. You got to dig in and do her. How often have we seen someone, a couple, where one spouse dies, and what happens next? The other spouse either dies within a year or lives another 20, right? And what didn't happen? The, the, the surviving spouse didn't reinvest in this new life. And so those are some of the tasks that, that have to be done when you're walking through the valley of the shadow. Accept the loss, experience the pain, adjust to life, and get reinvested in that new life. And again, there's not a specific order. You do it however works for you. And I'm going to suggest one of the safest places to do some of these tasks is with a piece of paper and a pen. Because when you lose a loved one, some, you might know the way that your mind starts to swirl and emotions start to twist and your gut starts to churn and you just can't put one thought in front of the other. You take a pen, you put it on paper, and you will. Because you'll put one word after another and then until it's one sentence after another until it's one paragraph after another and you will find what you need to find. I, I was reading one... Uh, a son's story of the loss of his mother. And what he said was, what you work out in your journal, you don't take out on your friends. I thought that was pretty impressively wise for a young man to say. And so those are some of the tasks of this journey. And the tasks are challenging, but in a sense they're far easier than the questions. Because there are some questions that come up when a loved one dies. And maybe they will, maybe they won't for you. As I've said before, different people's journeys through grief will be different. But what I have found is that when someone dies, especially when it's tragic or unexpected, is that there is an immediate, immediate start of questioning. Why did this happen? Why did this happen now? Why did this happen to such a good person? Why did it happen when their lives were starting to just come together? Why did it happen when a grandchild was about to be born? Why did it happen when they had just retired with all that life? Why did this happen? And if you find yourself questioning why in the midst of this valley of the shadow, know that you are in good company. When you read the words of Job, those words are sharp with anger. Because you read the words of Job, you take those words off the page, and what you hear is Job shaking his finger at God and saying, Why has death come to my house? That is the, that's the tone of the book of Job. How dare you bring death to my house, my daughters? Because he lost family. And, and that's, it's not just Job. You, you look at David. You read the Psalms. Again and again in the Psalms, David struggles with grief. And he, he finds God at the other end. But again and again, he goes back to that. We turn to Jesus himself on the cross. Why have you forsaken me? He didn't say that politely. <laughs> that was a question in a very loud voice. And so if you find yourself shaking a finger at God, yelling in a field, know that you are in good company, and if that's part of your grief, that's okay. God's big enough to take it. God's taken it before, and God will take it again. I will warn you, though, if you find yourself asking this question, in all likelihood, you're not going to find a satisfying answer. It, it's probably not going to, you're probably not going to come to a moment when you say, yes, this all makes sense to me. Because it is the very nature of something tragic that it doesn't make sense. Why must someone as young as that host that her boy die? 
it doesn't make sense, and that's what makes it so wrong. I, I was reading a, a story of uh, Rick Lisher writes a story of, of the death of his son Adam, and Adam dies a month before his daughter is born, and. Uh, and Ad, the fact that Adam never had the opportunity to sit and kiss his daughter goodnight is wrong. It's evil. It makes no sense. It is tragic. And, and, and you ask why, and the fact that it does, make, does not make sense is what makes it so wrong. And, and reading that, I was reading that sentence this morning, right, right here. I was reading that sentence, and, and, and I told you how grief street, uh, sneaks up on you. And, and as I was reading that sentence, I realized my daughter will never pet the deer with my Aunt Dorothy. You'd go out and my Aunt Dorothy had a deer pen. And you'd go out into that deer pen and, and the deer would sneak up on you and you'd feel two little taps on your shoulders. And you'd turn around and there was a deer looking at you. And it was playing with you. And, and it was awesome. And this morning I sat here and I wept as I realized I will never bring my daughter to do that. It's wrong. It makes no sense. And if it did make sense, then it wouldn't be so wrong and broken. And, and so ask these questions, but no, you're not going to find a good answer. Now the other hard question besides why does this happen is where is God in the midst of it? Where is God in, in the midst of, of such tragedy? Sometimes what happens is you can't find God in the same way you have found God before. And the God who has seemed so present to you is hard to find. We who are gathered here today, we are gathered because we have experienced the goodness of God, the grace of God, the joy of God, the forgiveness of God. We are gathered as people who proclaim God to be real and to be our creator and the one we are committed to following. And yet there are moments in the midst of the valley of the shadow when it is hard to find that God. C.S. Lewis writes about this when his wife dies. He writes, How, why can't I feel, find, see, hear, or touch God in the way I have before? And the best he can come up with is he says, You know how when you're weeping so hard that you can't see anyone because the tears fill your eyes? You know how sometimes if, if you're yelling so loud for help that you can't hear someone saying, I'm on my way? You ever seen a person drowning and they're flailing for help and the very flailing for help makes it impossible to hold them and pull them to the shore? Sometimes it is our very desperation that makes it hard to see or hear or feel God again. And we just have to trust that God continues to walk with us even when the tears are in the way. If you go back to Job, I want to point out that at the end of chapter 31 it said these are the ends of, of the words of Job he started ranting back in chapter 3 and he rants for almost 30 chapters shaking his finger at God and then God shows up was God not there all along or did Job finally have to get to the point where he wasn't so desperate that he could finally hear what God had to say And then once Job hears what God has to say, when God, says, God does respond to his questions of why, and he does not give him an answer of why, what he gives Job is an experience of God's grandeur and power and to show, and to show Job that he is greater than any of Job's problems, greater than any of these griefs. And in the end, that's enough for Job. Job, he doesn't have an answer to why, but what he does have is a trust in the God that will walk with him next. And he does have more daughters, and he does have more flocks, and life begins anew, and he comes out of, on the other side of the valley of the shadow. He comes out because grief is not a problem to fix, it's a journey to take. Grief on this journey, there are tasks, experiencing the pain, accepting the, the loss, adjusting to a new life, re reinvesting yourself. There are, there are questions in the middle of this journey. Why did this happen, and where is God in the middle of it? But in the end, it's a journey. And next week, we're going to turn to how do we take a journey with people. Uh, that, the two things I've heard most as I've talked about th these sermons and these series, I've heard people in grief tell me about the details of that grief. And just as often, I've heard people say, and I don't know what to do. 
When someone is grieving, when someone has lost a loved one, I'm not sure, should I show up, should I not, should I call or not, should I bring... And, and we're going to look at that next week. We're going to look at how do you love someone, how do you walk with someone on the journey? Not leading them, not abandoning them, but walking with them. But before we get there, I want to have one last word for those of us who are grieving or, or for those of us when, when we do take this journey through grief. One last word. I have heard many times when someone is in the middle of grief that uh, they don't want to be a burden. How often do we hear that? I don't want to be a burden. I don't want to ask for your help because it's not fair. You know what? The word fair is not in the Bible. It's just it's simply not fair. And, and to be a burden, it's, that's not the case. What happens when I'm invited into a person's life in the midst of their grief, it is not that they're trying to be a burden unto me. But what happens is I feel a great sense of honor because a person has trusted me with one of the most vulnerable parts of their lives. And so when the day comes you find yourself making this journey, do not look around and think, I'm a burden. Look around and say, who do I honor and who do I trust to take this journey with me? And someone will, and you'll get through it. Amen.